An Ascent of Kilauea by Anna Brassey. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Larry Wilson. At last we found ourselves at the very edge of the old crater, the bed of which, three or four hundred feet beneath us, was surrounded by steep and in many places overhanging sides. It looked like an enormous cauldron, four or five miles in width, full of a mass of cooled pitch. In the center was the still glowing stream of dark red lava flowing slowly toward us, and in every direction were red-hot patches and flames and smoke issuing from the ground. Yet the first sensation is rather one of disappointment, as one expects greater activity on the part of the volcano. But the new crater was still to be seen, containing the lake of fire, with steep walls rising up in the midst of the sea of lava. We spent the night at the volcano house, and at three o'clock the next afternoon we set out, a party of eight, with two guides and three porters to carry our wraps and provisions, and to bring back specimens. First of all we descended the precipice, three hundred feet in depth, forming the wall of the old crater, and now thickly covered with vegetation. It was so steep in many places that flights of zigzag wooden steps have been inserted in the face of the cliff in some places in order to render the descent practicable at the bottom we stepped straight on to the surface of the cold boiled lava which we had seen from above last night even here in every crevice where a few grains of soil had collected delicate little ferns might be seen struggling for life and thrusting out their green fronds toward the light it was the most extraordinary walk imaginable over that vast plain of lava, twisted and distorted into every conceivable shape and form, according to the temperature it had originally attained and the rapidity with which it had cooled, its surface like half-molten glass, cracking and breaking beneath our feet. Sometimes we came to a patch that looked like the contents of a pot, suddenly petrified in the act of boiling. Sometimes the black, iridescent lava had assumed the form of waves, or more frequently, of huge masses of rope twisted and coiled together. Sometimes it was piled up like a collection of organ pipes, or had gathered into mounds and cones of various dimensions. As we proceeded, the lava became hotter and hotter, and from every crack arose gaseous fumes, affecting our noses and throats in a painful manner, till at last when we had to pass to leeward of the molten stream flowing from the lake, the vapors almost choked us, and it was with difficulty we continued to advance. The lava was more glassy and transparent-looking, as if it had been fused at a higher temperature than usual, and the crystals of sulfur, alum, and other minerals, with which it abounded, reflected the light in bright prismatic colors. In places it was quite transparent, and we could see beneath it the long streaks of a stringy kind of lava, like brown spun glass called Pele's hair. At last we reached the foot of the present crater and commenced the ascent of the outer wall. Many times the thin crust gave way beneath our guide, and he had to retire quickly from the hot, blinding, choking fumes that immediately burst forth. But we succeeded in reaching the top, and then what a sight presented itself to our astonished eyes! I could neither speak nor move at first, but could only stand and gaze at the horrible grandeur of the scene. We were standing on the extreme edge of a precipice, overhanging a lake of molten fire a hundred feet below us, nearly a mile across. Dashing against the cliffs on the opposite side, with a noise like the roar of a stormy ocean, waves of blood-red fiery liquid lava hurled their billows upon an iron-bound headland, and then rushed up the face of the cliffs to toss their glory spray high in the air. The restless heaving lake boiled and bubbled, never remaining the same for two minutes together. Its normal color seemed to be a dull dark red, covered with a thin gray scum, which every moment and in every part swelled and cracked and emitted fountains, cascades, and whirlpools of yellow and red fire, while sometimes one big golden river, sometimes four or five, flowed across it. As the sun set and darkness enveloped the scene, it became more awful than ever. We retired a little way from the brink to breathe some fresh air and to try to eat the food we had brought with us. But this was an impossibility. Every instant a fresh explosion or glare made us jump up to survey the scene. The violent struggles of the lava to escape from its fiery bed, and the loud and awful noises by which they were at times accompanied, 
suggested the idea that some imprisoned monsters were trying to release themselves from their bondage with shrieks and groans and cries of agony and despair at the futility of their efforts sometimes there were at least seven spots on the borders of the lake where the molten lava dashed up furiously against the rocks seven fire fountains playing at the same time i had for some time been feeling very hot and uncomfortable and on looking round the cause was at once apparent not two inches beneath the surface the grey lava on which we were standing and sitting was red hot a stick thrust through it caught fire a piece of paper was immediately destroyed and the gentlemen found the heat from the crevices so great that they could not approach near enough to light their pipes one more long last look and then we turned our faces away from the scene that had enthralled us for so many hours the whole of the lava we had crossed in the extinct crater was now aglow in many patches and in all directions flames were bursting forth fresh lava flowing and steam and smoke were issuing from the surface it was a toilsome journey back again walking as we did in single file and obeying the strict charges of our head guide to follow him closely and to tread exactly in his footsteps on the whole it was easier by night than by day to distinguish the route to be taken as we could now see the dangers that before we could only feel and many were the fiery crevices we stepped over and jumped across once i slipped and my foot sank through the thin crust sparks issued from the ground and the stick on which i leaned it caught fire before i could fairly recover myself end of an ascent of kilauea by anna brassey Fichte and Kant on Censorship by Johann Fichte and Immanuel Kant. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Fichte to Kant, 22nd January, 1792 a friend whom i respect has written to me a kind and touching letter upon this subject in which he requests that in the event of a possible revision of the work during the delay which has occurred in printing i should endeavour to set two points upon which we are at issue in another light i have said that faith in a given revelation cannot reasonably be founded upon belief in miracles because no miracle is demonstrable as such but i have added in a note that it may be allowable to employ the idea of miracles having occurred in connection with a revelation in order to direct the attention of those who need the aid of outward and sensible manifestations to the other sufficient grounds upon which the revelation may be received as divine the only modification of the former principle which i can admit i have said further that a revelation cannot extend the materials of either our dogmatic or of our moral knowledge but i admit that upon transcendental objects in the fact of which existence we believe while we know nothing whatever of the mode of that existence it may furnish us with something in the room of experience something which for those who so conceive of such matters shall possess a subjective truth which however is not to be received as a substantial addition to but only an embodied and formal manifestation of those spiritual things possessed by us a priori notwithstanding continued reflection upon these points i have hitherto discovered nothing which can justify me in altering my conclusions may i venture to ask you sir as the most competent judge to tell me in two words whether any other results upon these points are to be sought for and if so in what direction or if these are the only grounds on which a critique of the revelation idea can safely proceed if you will favour me with these two words of reply i shall make no use of them inconsistent with the deep respect i entertain for you as to my friend's letter i have already said in answer that i do not cease to give my attention to the subject and shall always be ready to retract what i am convinced is erroneous as to the prohibition of the censor 
after the clearly declared object of the essay and the tone which predominates throughout its pages i can only wonder at it i cannot understand where the theological faculty acquired the right to apply their censorship to such a mode of treating such a subject kant's reply second february seventeen ninety two you desire to be informed by me whether any remedy can be found against the strict censorship upon which your book has fallen without entirely laying it aside i answer none so far as without having read the book thoroughly i can determine from what your letter announces as its leading principle namely that faith in a given revelation cannot reasonably be founded on a belief in miracles for it inevitably follows from this that a religion can contain only such articles of faith as likewise belong to the province of pure reason this principle is in my opinion quite unobjectionable and does not abolish the subjective necessity either of revelation or of miracle for it may be assumed that whether or not it might have been possible for reason unaided by revelation to have discovered those articles of faith which now when they are actually before us may indeed be comprehended by reason yet it may have been necessary to introduce them as miracles which however now when religion can support itself and its articles need no longer be relied upon as the foundation of belief but according to the maxims which seem to be adopted by the censor this principle will not carry you through for according to these certain writings must be received into the profession of faith according to their letter since it is difficult for the human understanding to comprehend them and much more for human reason to conceive of them as true and hence they really need the continued support of miracle and thus only can become articles of reasonable belief the view which represents revelation as merely a sensible manifestation of these principles in accommodation to human weakness and hence as possessed of subjective truth only is not sufficient for the censor for his views demand the recognition of its subjective truth according to the letter one way however remains open to bring your book into harmony with the idea of the censor for example if you can make him comprehend and approve the distinction between a dogmatic belief raised above all doubt and a mere moral admission resting on the insufficiency of reason to satisfy its own wants for then the faith which good moral sentiment reposes upon miracle may probably thus express itself lord i believe that is i receive it willingly although i cannot prove it sufficiently help thou mine unbelief that is i have a moral faith in respect to all i can draw from the miraculous narrative for the purposes of inward improvement and i desire to possess an historical belief in so far as that can contribute to the same end my unintentional non-belief is not confirmed unbelief but you will not easily make this distinction acceptable to a censor who it is to be feared makes historical belief an unconditional religious duty with these hastily but not inconsiderably thrown out ideas you may do whatever seems good to you provided you are yourself convinced of their truth without making any direct or indirect allusion to him who communicates them End of Fichte and Kant on Censorship by Johann Fichte and Immanuel Kant Ceylon, the Island of Jewels by Leopold Clermont This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org the gem minerals with which ceylon is so generously endowed are remarkable not only for their beauty 
but also on account of the great variety of them. Although the diamond, opal, emerald, and peridot are conspicuous by their absence, all the other well-known transparent gems are abundantly represented in the island. There are also many very beautiful precious stones with which the general public at all events is more or less unfamiliar. The principal mineral is corundum, of which the red and blue varieties constitute the gems ruby and sapphire. It, however, also occurs in a long series of different colors of varying shades, which range from the ruby red to delicate rose pink, from the royal sapphire to sky blue, from plum to violet and lilac, and from golden orange to primrose. There is also a most attractive rich salmon pink variety, resembling the tint of the sunrise rose, and which is known in Ceylon as patparagum, and very rarely only the mineral is found green in the island. In central Queensland, however, at a place called Anaki, the green variety is fairly plentiful, while the red and purple are entirely absent. Some of the corundum gemstones exhibit the phenomenon of asterism, that is, they display a bright, shimmering, six-pointed star, with the rays divergent from the center of the stone when it is cut with a smooth, convex surface. They are found almost exclusively in Ceylon. A few ruby star stones are found in Burma, and under the name of Asterias, or star stones, are highly valued by connoisseurs when of choice quality. For some unknown reason, the yellow and green varieties of corundum do not exhibit the phenomenon of asterism. Another gem mineral possesses a similar extensive range of color, except that yellow is missing, is the spinel. Some specimens of this somewhat resemble rubies and sapphires, and are therefore often described as spinel rubies and spinel sapphires, respectively. It is, however, very much softer than corundum, and is one of the three gemstones occurring in the form of crystals, which are singly refractive, the other two being diamond and garnet. There is a remarkable flame-red variety of spinel, the color of which is unique in the whole mineral world, not even excepting the ruby. It is an exquisite gem of great value. The crystal beryl is an attractive gemstone, although its beauty is somewhat unappreciated. It occurs in shades of autumn green, brown, and yellow, and possesses great brilliancy. There are, however, two varieties of this gem mineral which form well-known and valuable precious stones. Of these, the most important is known as the alexandrite. Fine examples of this gem by daylight appear pistachio green, changing to rich mulberry red by artificial light. Ceylon is the chief source of alexandrites, although a few are found in Siberia. The other important variety of chrysoberyl is the cymophane, or cat's eye, which, when cut with a smooth convex face, presents a narrow white line glittering across it which has a fancied resemblance to the iris of a cat. The position of the line or ray alters as light strikes it from different angles, giving a peculiarly mysterious effect. Simophanes are only found in Ceylon. The rarest and most curious of all precious stones are those cat's eyes which change from green to red, as do the Alexandrites. By the superstitious natives, the Simophane is considered to be an entombed spirit, and this can be more readily understood than many other similar conceits because of the strange resemblance of the stone to the eye of an animal. Many shades of soft yellow, brown, cinnamon, and green are displayed by specimens of the mineral jargoon or zircon. This gemstone is strangely unappreciated, for not only is the coloring most pleasing, but the brilliance is second only to that of the diamond. Another reason why the neglect of the zircon is unaccountable is that this beautiful gem is comparatively inexpensive. The writer has only space briefly to complete the list of precious stones of Ceylon, for his object is to give the reader some idea of the manner in which they are handled. There are garnets, red, brown, violet, and cinnamon, topazes, white and blue, tourmalines, red, claret, green, yellow, and blue, aquamarines or beryls, sky blue and sea green, besides iolotes and moonstones. From the foregoing paragraphs it should be apparent that these gems present a pageant of color unequaled by those of any other district. From the finding of a precious stone in a riverbed or gem pit, to its use as a jewel by a woman of fashion, it passes through many strange hands and undergoes much alteration in appearance. The securing, cutting, polishing, and marketing of such a large number of gems necessarily comprise an important industry. 
the entire trade is controlled locally by the moormen many of whom are extremely wealthy the foremost of them not only buy up the most important stones as they are found from time to time but send out expeditions into the principal gem producing areas to search for them they all either retain their own cutters or superintend the work given out to be done no foreigner is admitted within the magic circle of the moormen except as a customer the moormen are descendants of the moors who once occupied ceylon and of whose forts large ruins still exist in the island the value of the precious stones annually exported to europe and america from ceylon is estimated at three million pounds and high prices especially for choice specimens are realized locally from travelers and tourists the gemstones are of igneous origin and have been loosened from the granite and nisic rocks in which they were formed by disintegration they are found in a stratum of alluvial gravel which is known to the natives as ilam which is reached by digging pits of from three to thirty feet in depth they are generally in the form of more or less water-worn nodules undamaged crystals being very rare when the pits are deep the ilum is hoisted to the surface by means of a primitive kind of wooden crane and it is then carried to the nearest stream or pool to be washed it is often found in low-lying spots and old disused gem pits which have become filled with water are available for the washing of the gem bearing material the ilum consists of gravel embedded in yellow or reddish clay and is usually brought to the surface in a dry condition but when the gem pit is below the level of a neighboring stream it is rather muddy sometimes the stratum of ilum crops out or is exposed upon the surface of the country and this is generally found to occur on the slopes and banks of rivers and streams when this is the case very little excavation is done as the material is more easily obtainable the searching for gems is carried on from october to march the washing is done by means of a circular basin-shaped basket about twenty-eight inches in diameter and twelve in depth which is called a gemming basket the native wading up to his knees holds the basket in the water a circular turning movement is given to the basket which is occasionally allowed to tilt below the surface of the water and in this way the lighter stones slip over the edge and the heavier ones remain in the basket after a good many baskets full of gravel have been washed in this way the residue which is found to contain thorionite and thorite and other heavy minerals is carefully searched for gemstones the number of gems found of insignificant value is extremely large in proportion to that of the choice specimens so that often a great deal of work is done before there is any prospect of recompense when an important stone is discovered there is great excitement among the natives and many would-be buyers eagerly endeavor to outdo each other in obtaining a bargain the price asked is generally several times greater than that which is eventually accepted and by continual bartering the gem changes hands repeatedly also there are ever ready pilfering fingers to purloin from the rightful owner or to substitute an inferior stone for one of good quality the diggers and washers are continually watched to prevent anything of the kind from taking place. It is a matter of great difficulty for Europeans to obtain details or photographs of the gemming industry, for the natives are very jealous and secretive, and object to company upon their expeditions. They are also exceedingly superstitious, and believe in all sorts of devils and evil omens. They will not even allow one of their own women to go near a gem pit, because she would be sure to bring bad luck to it there are several extensive districts in the island where precious stones occur but the most productive locality is the hilly country of saffragan the chief town of which is ratnampura or in other words the city of rubies nearly all the different kinds of gems are found occurring together the exceptions being moonstones amethysts and alexandrites the last of which are principally derived from gaul the natives have a great prejudice against sending gems out of the island in the rough state and always cut and polish them locally this is due to their anxiety to see exactly to what extent the beauty of each stone is developed by the cutting and thus accurately to estimate the value they do not care to part with the rough stones for europeans to reap the benefit of any increase in value the cutting and polishing is done by the singalese upon perpendicular leaden wheels smeared with emery against one side of which the gem is pressed with the left hand, while the wheel is rotated by means of a bow and cord held in the right. The whole apparatus is most simple and primitive. 
the success of the work depending entirely upon the skill of the operator. The cutters squat upon their haunches behind the wheels, and sometimes an overseer watches the progress of work to prevent theft. Much of the cutting is done by the roadside in view of every passerby, but many little tricks of the trade are withheld from public view. The native gem cutter's chief object is to so manipulate the precious stone that the maximum of size and weight is retained, often to the sacrifice of symmetry and brilliancy. They are wonderfully adept at retaining and regulating the color, which in some gemstones is not of uniform density throughout, and in dexterously hiding feathers and flaws. Owing, however, to irregularity, and also to the want of symmetry and proper proportion, it is generally found that the gemstones in the native cut condition are unsuitable for the requirements of high-class European jewelry. It is therefore necessary, before they can be used for the purpose, that they shall be recut by a skilled lapidary with a knowledge of mineralogy and optics. In principle, the apparatus used by the European gem cutter is similar to that used by the Moor in Ceylon. The wheel is, however, made of copper and diamond dust and revolves horizontally instead of perpendicularly. The operator sits at a bench and places the gem, mounted on a small ebony holder, against the surface of the wheel, which he rotates by means of a crank held in the left hand. Although the apparatus is simple, much expert knowledge, skill, and experience are requisite for success in this delicate and artistic craft. End of Ceylon, the Island of Jewels by Leopold Claremont Cochineal from Insects and Man, an account of the more important, harmful, and beneficial insects, their habits and life histories, 1915, by C. A. Eland. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Cochineal Insect, Dactylopius coccus is another member of the family Coccidae, deserving a place among the useful insects. Without exaggeration, it may justly be called the most celebrated of all the scale insects. Cochineal, in the larval and female adult forms, is essentially parasitic upon the prickly pear, Opuntia coccinellifera, though it lives equally well on some other allied species. The adult male is very minute, only a millimeter in length, and of a carmine color, which is intensified on its head and thorax. The wings, which are longer than the body, have only a single bifurcated yellowish-brown vein, and the head is provided with four compound and two simple eyes, whilst from the last segment of the abdomen two long bristles arise. The female is about six times larger than the male, measuring from six to seven millimeters in length, deep red-brown in color, and segmented, though the segments are hidden by a white, waxy secretion. The life history of this insect is so similar to that of our other examples from the same family, the lac insect and the San Jose scale, that there is no need for reiteration. The winged male dies after mating. The resting female deposits her offspring, according to some authorities, viviparously, according to others, as eggs. But whichever is the method, the larvae are covered by the waxy secretion of their mother, in which, though very active, they remain for about nine days. At first, they closely resemble their mother, who, by the way, dies after oviposition but even at this stage the sexes can be distinguished for the antennae of the males are composed of five segments while those of the females have six in a fortnight after several molts the larvae are full grown the male during growth surrounds itself with a waxy covering from which it emerges in the winged adult form after the last molt but the female remains on the spot where she first plunged her larval rostrum into the tissues of the prickly pear. 
the commercial history of this insect is perhaps of greater interest than its life history a native of mexico it was known and utilized by the aztecs before america was discovered by europeans lopez de gomara in 1525 first described cochineal but he took it to be a seed and it was not until the time of plumier in 1666 that its true insect nature was guessed even then however many scientists of that and later times persisted in believing the seed theory so in 1729 melchior de ruscher published certain documents he had received from mexico which once and for all settled the question when the spaniards conquered mexico they recognized that the cochineal industry would be a source of wealth and they at once tried to establish a monopoly punishing with death anyone detected attempting to take the female insects out of the country this monopoly was strictly upheld and as long as mexico remained a spanish colony cochineal could be obtained through spain and spain alone that the industry was no mean one may be gathered from a statement in de lambert and diderot's encyclopedia in which they say that eight hundred thousand pounds of cochineal of the value of fifteen million five hundred thousand six hundred and ninety francs reached europe in seventeen thirty four and in seventeen sixty the insect to the value of four million francs reached marseilles alone and de humboldt relates that at the time of his voyage to america the annual export of this commodity exceeded twelve million francs de ruscher gives some interesting details of the cultivation of cochineal by the mexicans at the beginning of the eighteenth century during the winter the insects were kept indoors as a protection from inclement weather but when the warm weather arrived as soon as they were old enough to reproduce their kind they were placed twelve together in little nests made by the natives out of hay straw moss or best of all from the most tender fibers of the coconut the nests and their contents were then affixed to the prickly pears and in due course the larvae emerged from the nests sought out the greenest and youngest parts of the plants and collected for the most part on the sides sheltered from the prevailing winds during their growth they were most carefully tended and protected from their enemies even spiders webs being cleaned from the prickly pears lest the precious insects should be harmed moreover the wild cochineal insects which also flourished on the same plants were considered so objectionable that they were not allowed to mingle with their pampered relatives there were three harvests a year and at the last one branches laden with the cochineal parasites were cut and taken indoors so that they might be protected during the rainy season the usual method of killing the insects was either by pouring boiling water over them or by roasting them in specially constructed ovens at times however they were roasted on the frying pans which the native women used for baking their bread and in drying the insects lost one-third of their weight these cultural methods have changed but little with the march of time Remour, the celebrated french scientist in his writings predicted that the time would come when cochineal would be smuggled out of mexico in the same manner that the silkworm had reached europe from china forty years later theory de menonville inspired by what Remour had written traveled to mexico secured some of the coveted insects and took them to port au prince a native insurrection however put an end to the venture which was never repeated in 1806 the insect made its first appearance in europe where its food plant had long been known at cadiz 
Toulon, in the south of Spain, and in Italy, unsuccessful attempts were made to acclimatize it. In 1810, owing to an insurrection, Mexico was lost to Spain, and 17 years later, further attempts were made to establish the insect in Corsica, Sardinia, and in the neighborhood of Granada and Valencia. As before, the attempt resulted in failure, for the climate of Europe was evidently ill-suited to so delicate an insect. In the same year, however, cochineal was introduced into the Canary Islands, and a veritable godsend it proved to the islanders. The director of the botanic gardens at Orotava, Bertholo by name, received some living specimens from Cadiz and placed them on the prickly pears in his gardens. So well did the insects thrive that by the end of the year he proposed to distribute them over the island to all who had the necessary food plants on their land. His project was received with scant courtesy and almost opposition, so that it also came to naught. Almost at the same time, the Spanish government established a cochineal farm at Santa Cruz, and despite the fact that those in charge displayed unwanted energy in the matter, sent the insects to the neighboring islands, and used every means to interest the peasant proprietors in the scheme, in less than two years all trace of the industry had vanished not so however the insects themselves in the neighborhood of orotava when left to themselves they increased rapidly so much so that in eighteen thirty three after an island life of only five years they threatened to totally destroy the prickly pears which the poorer inhabitants used as food measures for the extermination of the insects were set on foot but before they had been put into execution, some of the islanders, more far-seeing than their neighbors, took up the cultivation of the prickly pear, and incidentally of cochineal, with the result that the once despised insect became the greatest source of wealth that the Canary Islands have ever known. From an export of eight and a half pounds of cochineal in 1831, the island industry increased by leaps and bounds to a total export of 842,827 pounds in 1850. When we take into consideration that one pound of dried cochineal represents about 70,000 insects, the insect mortality in these favorable years was beyond computation. During part of this time, the vines in the Canary Islands were almost totally destroyed by a fungoid disease, and cochineal, in very truth, saved the islanders from starvation. In the Canary Islands, the insects are cultivated mainly on cactus tuna and a dwarf species. The former, a large leafed species, is utilized in Tenerife, and on the eastern islands. The latter, smaller-leaved species, finds favor in Las Palmas and the other islands. In the early days of the industry, women were employed to collect the insects from the plants in metal spoons, a slow method that entailed much waste. Now, however, a quicker method is used. The branches are gathered and then beaten with small brooms made of palm leaves in order to detach the insects. This rough pruning causes the plants to send out the fresh young growth, which is so essential for the cochineal. In order to make certain that the young insects shall be well looked after in early life, the fertilized females, recognized by a reddish posterior spot, are carefully collected, covered with a linen cloth, and subjected to a temperature of about 20 degrees centigrade. This proceeding hastens the advent of the larvae, which on their first appearance show great activity, but eventually settle down on the surrounding linen. The fragments of linen are then carried by night 
and fastened to the prickly pears and without delay the larval insects affix themselves to the plant and begin feeding the linen however is left on the plant for some time to give shade to the larvae and to keep them dry in three months the cochineal insects are fully developed and harvest time is at hand women do the work some breaking off the branches others brushing them in order to remove the insects which are then spread in thin layers and dried in the sun or subjected to a temperature of about forty degrees centigrade after drying the insects are cleaned from portions of their food plants and other impurities and then are put on the market as plateada or as madres the former which are the majority and therefore cheaper are the young unmated females the latter are females which have produced young at the present day the cochineal insect is cultivated mainly in honduras and the canary islands and though the industry has languished considerably since the discovery of aniline dyes its fall is as nothing compared to the fall in price of the commodity which at the present day is less than a fifth of what it was in the heyday of the industry of the uses of cochineal we have spoken in another chapter but the least sentimental of us must regret that a beautiful red dye once universally used and around which hangs such an atmosphere of romance is now mainly of service in the decoration of fancy cakes and of cochineal from insects and man an account of the more important harmful and beneficial insects their habits and life histories 1915 by c a eland read for librivox by sue anderson the contented man by g k chesterton this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org the word content is not inspiring nowadays rather it is irritating because it is dull it prepares the mind for a little sermon in the style of the vicar of wakefield about how you and i should be satisfied with our countrified innocence and our simple village sports the word however has two meanings somewhat singularly connected the sweet content of the poet and the cubic content of the mathematician some distinguish these by stressing the different syllables thus it might happen to any of us at some social juncture to remark a gaily of the content of the king of the cannibal islands stew-pot i am content to be ignorant or not content with measuring the cubic content of my safe you are stealing the spoons and there really is an analogy between the mathematical and the moral use of the term for the lack of the observation of which the latter has been much weakened and misused the preaching of contentment is in disrepute well deserved in so far that the moral is really quite inapplicable to the anarchy and insane peril of our tall and toppling cities content suggests some kind of security and it is not strange that our workers should often think about rising above their position since they have so continually to think about sinking below it the philanthropist who urges the poor to saving and simple pleasures deserves all the derision that he gets to advise people to be content with what they have got may or may not be sound moral philosophy but to urge people to be content with what they haven't got is a piece of impudence hard for even the english poor to pardon but though the creed of content is unsuited to certain special riddles and wrongs it remains true for the normal of mortal life we speak of divine discontent discontent may sometimes be a divine thing but content must always be the human thing it may be true that a particular man in his relation to his master or his neighbor 
to his country or his enemies will do well to be fiercely unsatisfied or thirsting for an angry justice but it is not true no sane person can call it true that man as a whole in his general attitude towards the world in his posture towards death or green fields towards the weather or the baby will be wise to cultivate dissatisfaction in a broad estimate of our earthly experience the great truism on the tablet remains he must not covet his neighbor's ox nor his ass nor anything that is his in highly complex and scientific civilizations he may sometimes find himself forced into an exceptional vigilance but then in highly complex and scientific civilizations nine times out of ten he only wants his own ass back but i wish to urge the case for cubic content in which even more than in moral content i take a personal interest now moral content has been undervalued and neglected because of its separation from the other meaning it has become a negative rather than a positive thing in some accounts of contentment it seems to be little more than a meek despair but this is not the true meaning of the term it should stand for the idea of a positive and thorough appreciation of the content of anything for feeling the substance and not merely the surface of experience content ought to mean in english as it does in french being pleased placidly perhaps but still positively pleased being contented with bread and cheese ought not to mean not caring what you eat it ought to mean caring for bread and cheese handling and enjoying the cubic content of the bread and cheese and adding it to your own being content with an attic ought not to mean being unable to move from it and resigned to living in it it ought to mean appreciation what there is to appreciate in such a position such as the quaint and elvish slope of the ceiling or the sublime aerial view of the opposite chimney-pots and in this sense contentment is a real and even an active virtue it is not only affirmative but creative the poet in the attic does not forget the attic in poetic musings he remembers whatever the attic has of poetry he realizes how high how starry how cool how unadorned and simple in short how attic is the attic true contentment is a thing as active as agriculture it is the power of getting out of any situation all there is in it it is arduous and it is rare the absence of this digestive talent is what makes so cold and incredible the tales of so many people who say they have been through things when it is evident that they have come out on the other side quite unchanged a man might have gone through a plum pudding as a bullet might go through a plum pudding it depends on the size of the pudding and the man but the awful and sacred question is has the pudding been through him has he tasted appreciated and absorbed the solid pudding with its three dimensions and its three thousand tastes and smells can he offer himself to the eyes of men as one who has cubically conquered and contained a pudding in the same way we may ask of those who profess to have passed through trivial or tragic experiences whether they have absorbed the content of them whether they licked up such living water as there was it is a pertinent question in connection with many modern problems thus the young genius says i have lived in my dreary and squalid village before i found success in paris or vienna the sound philosopher will answer you have never lived in your village or you would not call it dreary and squalid thus the imperialist the colonial idealist who commonly speaks and always thinks with a yankee accent will say i've been right away from these little muddy islands and seen god's great seas and prairies the sound philosopher will reply you have never been in these islands you have never seen the weald of sussex or the plain of salisbury otherwise you could never have called them either muddy or little 
thus the suffragette will say i have passed through the paltry duties of pots and pans the drudgery of the vulgar kitchen but i have come out to intellectual liberty the sound philosopher will answer you have never passed through the kitchen or you never would call it vulgar wiser and stronger women than you have really seen poetry in pots and pans naturally because there is a poetry in them it is right for the village violinist to climb into fame in paris or vienna it is right for the stray englishman to climb across the high shoulder of the world it is right for the woman to climb into whatever cathedra or high places she can allow to her sexual dignity but it is wrong that any of these climbers should kick the ladder by which they have climbed but indeed these bitter people who record their experiences really record their lack of experiences it is the countryman who has not succeeded in being a countryman who comes up to london it is the clerk who has not succeeded in being a clerk who tries on vegetarian principles to be a countryman and the woman with a past is generally a woman angry about the past she never had when you have really exhausted an experience you always reverence and love it the two things that nearly all of us have thoroughly and really been through are childhood and youth and though we would not have them back again on any account we feel that they are both beautiful because we have drunk them dry end of the contented man by g k chesterton read by phil schempf the ecological toad from the frog book north american toads and frogs by mary c dickerson 1906 this is a librivox recording all LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. At the close of a hot summer's day, we sit on the doorstep of a country house, delighting in the coolness and repose, and watching the lengthening shadows of grape trellis, well curb, and house. A fat toad comes out from under the doorstep, where he has been quietly sleeping all day another clean and bright-eyed comes from under the sidewalk at our feet they start off with leisurely hops toward the garden to search for caterpillars and other delicious morsels of a toad's menu we watch their retreating backs until they disappear among rows of beets and lettuce and we wish them good hunting night after night summer after summer toads come out in search of food they become a part of the place they help make the home and contribute their share in its work toads choose cool moist places in which to live they are often found in cellars under porches and sidewalks and in various dark or damp hiding places they seek such locations not only for the shelter but also for the moisture a toad never has the pleasure of drinking water in the usual way all the water that he gets is absorbed through his skin a toad kept in a dry place grows thinner and more distressed looking and is likely to die within a few days whereas one provided with plenty of moisture remains plump and contented as the weeks go by even when there is a scarcity of food it would however be a great mistake to think that a toad does not take pleasure in drinking he sprawls out in shallow water or on a wet surface and has a contented expression in his wonderful eyes as he literally soaks in the water in the country in midsummer when pools and springs are dry Toads very often travel long distances to spend the night on the wet ground around a well of some sort. In their search for moisture, they sometimes unwittingly fall into wells to lead a most somber existence, feeding upon the few low forms of life that live there, and upon unfortunates who become prisoners in the same way that they themselves did. 
release may come if the well has a bucket but more likely their fate is a tragic one their crushed bodies have been taken from pumps into which they have been sucked they have sometimes been found hibernating in old wells where they must have been for ten or fifteen years judging by the amount of debris under which they are buried we always have been and still are somewhat prejudiced against the coldness of the toad he is less fortunate than we are in being wholly instead of only partially dependent on the sun for his warmth on a warm day his temperature may be very high and on a cold day he is very cold indeed so cold that he may snuggle deeper into his bed and sleep all day our epithet slimy he does not deserve at all in fact he is quite dry and comfortable to the touch at least he is so when we first take him up a moment later if we seized him too quickly and vigorously he may be somewhat wet for among his protective habits is the one of pouring out a colorless odorless fluid upon the enemy but even with this he is quite harmless in addition to this fluid the toad has another which is slightly poisonous and which is secreted by the skin this secretion is especially abundant in the paratoid glands the two large swellings behind the eyes when the toad is in very great agony as for example when he is seized by the teeth of an enemy he pours out this fluid in sufficient quantity to cause it to appear in milky drops on the gland like swellings this fluid has a disagreeable effect on the mucous membrane of the mouth and so protects the toad from many enemies watch the dog's behavior towards toads that have taken up residence in the garden or about the house he either gives them a wide berth or simply teases them being careful not to take them into his mouth a young dog may bite a toad but the experience is likely to prove so disagreeable that he does not repeat it the irritating secretion is not poured out at all unless the toad is in severe pain this fluid can do no injury to man unless it gets into the mouth or eyes the toad has been greatly maligned by stories of its poisonous effects on man and man's belongings instead of bringing ill luck the gentle fellow is one of our great blessings the toad has come to our gardens and to the very doors of our houses because he can get an abundance of food there also because as one of man's domestic animals he escapes some of his natural enemies as for man he may well look upon the toad at his door as a good fairy somewhat in disguise we must admit in fact we might let the toad remain wrapped in the veil of magic that the superstition of past ages put upon him but change the import of the magic to good instead of evil that the toad is the gardener's ally has been proved beyond a doubt the economic value of the toad has been recognized in this country as well as in others for many years gardeners in france have been glad to buy toads in order to have them as insect destroyers the toad remains quietly sleeping through the greater part of the day thereby keeping himself from being a nuisance and also saving himself from the danger of being stepped upon but at sunset or often earlier than that he comes out from his bed under porch or shrubbery and starts on his regular tour over lawns and through gardens the hunt is an exciting one for the toad eats living moving food only he must lie low approach cautiously but rapidly move most alertly at the final moment and perhaps meet with disappointment after all as the grasshopper takes wing or the caterpillar rolls into a motionless ball then there is always the possibility of a lurking enemy 
it may be a snake that lives under the woodpile and is out on his afternoon hunt or an owl that nests in the hollow oak and in the dusk approaches so silently that the first intimation of her nearness is the clutch of sharp claws or a skunk may roll the toad under his paw preliminary to swallowing it the chase must always be an eager one because the toad is always hungry his gastronomic ability is so great that he must have four meals per day or rather his stomach must be filled and emptied four times in each twenty-four hours he must therefore hunt and eat almost incessantly in order to get as much as he needs the tongue of the toad with which he catches his food is admirably adapted to its work it has a sticky surface from which escape of the prey is impossible and it is fastened at the front instead of at the back the latter fact makes it possible for the toad to throw the tongue well out of the mouth the toad eats almost all kinds of small living things that are out in the late afternoon and at night he may sit for an hour or more on the back step and catch the flies and mosquitoes that come to the screen door in their attempt to get into the house he sits with head bent forward and eyes looking very bright and intelligent when he sees a fly alight within two inches of his nose he makes no perceptible movement of the head or body the mouth opens and the fly is gone when the fly alights further away the toad springs forward on his strong hind legs then easily slips back into a sitting posture again that is all that we can see but again the fly is gone look once more there are many chances to observe for he is bobbing back and forth as fast as possible and the flies are constantly disappearing the free hind end of the tongue is thrown out and pulled back so quickly that we can scarcely see the flash of pink the tongue touches the fly however which adheres to its sticky surface and so is carried far into the back of the mouth the toad walks over the lawn and catches the crickets the locusts and the grasshoppers there not in the least objecting to their hard coats their long spiny legs and the molasses of the locusts he may swallow even a bee or a wasp found on the low clovers or dandelions and seems to feel much less uncomfortable afterward than one might suppose further out in the garden he snaps up the beetles and bugs that are running close to the ground or eating the potato squash or cucumber leaves he rejoices as a blundering may beetle noisily sheaths its wings near him before it has time to begin the task of laying its many eggs it furnishes a mouthful that makes the toad shut his eyes hard several times to get the big thing swallowed for strange as it may seem the large eyes of the toad can be pressed down into the mouth as far below its roof as they rise above the head and the movement aids effectually in swallowing if the farmer could see he would surely smile with satisfaction for this may beetle is the mother of the white grubs that feed on roots and underground stems and so ruin his pasture and spoil his potato crop it is not beneath the dignity of the toad to sit and feast on the plant lice that live on the lettuce he swallows any spiders he may catch he may sit in one place for a long time and eat the ants that are about an ant hill or that gather on a decaying apple or pear he loiters about the roots of the corn and attacks the cutworms as they come out from their day hiding places and start to climb to the leaves they devour at night the dusk changes to night but as long as there is any light the toad can see his eyes are large and placed on the very top of his head the golden iris contracts more and more the pupil becomes correspondingly larger 
until the eye seems a great black hole in the toad's head he can see nothing when it is totally dark but there is usually enough light to see moving objects he can see the tent caterpillars that have left their silken homes on the apple or cherry tree and are hurrying over the ground to find sheltered spots in which to build cocoons he can see the caterpillar of the morning cloak butterfly on a similar search and swallows it spiny coat and all he has no difficulty in spying out the white marked tussock caterpillars that are changing their feeding grounds from rosebush to snowball or honeysuckle he does not seem to mind in the least if a caterpillar is thickly set with hairs in fact small one-year-old toads will seize and greedily eat the common hairy caterpillars click beetles that have been in hiding all day are often captured this would surely rejoice the heart of the farmer if only he could see for the young of these are the much fought wire worms that damage the growing vegetables and grains the following statistics are valuable not only in that they introduce us to the real worth of the toad but also because they are accurate being the results of scientific investigation of the matter it is found that eighty eight per cent of a toad's food consists of insects and other small creatures that are considered pests in the garden grain field or pasture it is estimated that in three months a toad will eat nine thousand nine hundred and thirty six injurious insects and that of this number one thousand nine hundred and eighty eight sixteen per cent of all its food are cutworms counting the cutworms only the estimated value of a single toad is nineteen dollars and eighty eight cents per year if the injury done by a single cutworm be put at the low figure of one cent per year during the pest of army worms one toad examined was found to have eaten fifty five of the caterpillars during the siege with gypsy moths there were found sixty five larvae in the stomach of one toad another toad which was examined was found to have eaten thirty seven full-grown tent caterpillars the farmer and the market gardener in the light of these statistics and face to face with their almost endless struggles against insect pests are beginning to value toads they have shown their recognition of the value of toads by asking for legislation to protect them similar to that which protects birds end of the ecological toad from the frog book north american toads and frogs by mary c dickerson 1906 read for librivox by sue anderson an essay concerning humane understanding volume two by john locke sixteen thirty two to seventeen o four excerpt this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org book three of words chapter one of words or language in general one man fitted to form articulate sounds god having designed man for a sociable creature made him not only with an inclination and under a necessity to have fellowship with those of his own kind but furnished him also with language which was to be the great instrument and common tie of society man therefore had by nature his organs so fashioned as to be fit to frame articulate sounds which we call words but this was not enough to produce language for parrots and several other birds will be taught to make articulate sounds distinct enough which yet by no means are capable of language two to use the sound as signs of ideas besides articulate sounds therefore it was further necessary that he should be able to use these sounds as signs of internal conceptions 
and to make them stand as marks for the ideas within his own mind whereby they might be made known to others and the thoughts of men's minds be conveyed from one to another three to make them general signs but neither was this sufficient to make words so useful as they ought to be it is not enough for the perfection of language that sounds can be made signs of ideas unless those signs can be so made use of as to comprehend several particular things for the multiplication of words would have perplexed their use had every particular thing needed a distinct name to be signified by to remedy this inconvenience language had yet a further improvement in the use of general terms whereby one word was made to mark a multitude of particular existences which advantageous use of sounds was obtained only by the difference of the ideas they were made signs of those names becoming general which are made to stand for general ideas and those remaining particular where the ideas they are used for are particular four to make them signify the absence of positive ideas besides these names which stand for ideas there be other words which men make use of not to signify any idea but the want or absence of some ideas simple or complex or all ideas together such as nihil in latin and in english ignorance and barrenness all which negative or privative words cannot be said properly to belong to or signify no ideas for then they would be perfectly insignificant sounds but they relate to positive ideas and signify their absence five words ultimately derived from such as signify sensible ideas it may also lead us a little towards the original of all our notions and knowledge if we remark how great a dependence our words have on common sensible ideas and how those which are made use of to stand for actions and notions quite removed from sense have their rise from thence and from obvious sensible ideas are transferred to more abstruse significations and made to stand for ideas that come not under the cognizance of our senses namely to imagine apprehend comprehend adhere conceive instill disgust disturbance tranquillity etc are all words taken from the operations of sensible things and applied to certain modes of thinking spirit in its primary signification is breath angel a messenger and i doubt not but if we could trace them to their sources we should find in all languages the names which stand for things that fall not under our senses to have had their first rise from sensible ideas by which we may give some kind of guess what kind of notions they were and whence derived which filled their minds who were the first beginners of language and how nature even in the naming of things unawares suggested to men the originals and principles of all their knowledge whilst to give names that might make known to others any operations they felt in themselves or any other ideas that came not under their senses they were fain to borrow words from ordinary known ideas of sensation by that means to make others the more easily to conceive those operations they experimented in themselves which made no outward sensible appearances and then when they had got known and agreed names to signify those internal operations of their minds they were sufficiently furnished to make known by words all their other ideas since they could consist of nothing but either of outward sensible perceptions or of the inward operations of their minds about them we have as has been proved no ideas at all but what originally came either from sensible objects without or what we feel within ourselves from the inward working of our own spirits of which we are conscious of ourselves within six distribution of subjects to be treated of 
but to understand better the use and force of language as subservient to instruction and knowledge it will be convenient to consider first to what it is that names in the use of language are immediately applied secondly since all except proper names are general and so stand not particularly for this or that single thing but for sorts and ranks of things it will be necessary to consider in the next place what the sorts and kinds or if you would rather say the latin names what the species and genera of things are wherein they consist and how they come to be made these being as they ought well looked into we shall the better come to find the right use of words the natural advantages and defects of language and the remedies that ought to be used to avoid the inconveniences of obscurity or uncertainty in the signification of words without which it is impossible to discourse with any clearness or order concerning knowledge which being conversant about propositions and those most commonly universal ones has greater connection with words than perhaps is suspected these considerations therefore shall be the matter of the following chapters chapter two of the signification of words one words are sensible signs necessary for communication of ideas man though he have great variety of thoughts and such from which others as well as himself might receive profit and delight yet they are all within their own breast invisible and hidden from others nor can of themselves be made to appear the comfort and advantage of society not being to be had without communication of thoughts it was necessary that man should find out some external sensible signs whereof of those invisible ideas which his thoughts are made up of might be made known to others for this purpose nothing was so fit either for plenty or quickness as those articulate sounds which with so much ease and variety he found himself able to make thus we may conceive how words which were by nature so well adapted to that purpose came to be made use of by men as the signs of their ideas not by any natural connection that there is between particular articulate sounds and certain ideas for then there would be but one language amongst all men but by a voluntary imposition whereby such a word is made arbitrarily the mark of such an idea the use then of words is to be sensible marks of ideas and the ideas they stand for are their proper and immediate signification two words in their immediate signification are the sensible signs of his ideas who uses them the use men have of these marks being either to record their own thoughts for the assistance of their own memory or as it were to bring out their ideas and lay them before the view of others words in their primary or immediate signification stand for nothing but the ideas in the mind of him that uses them how imperfectly soever or carelessly those ideas are collected from the things which they are supposed to represent when a man speaks to another it is that he may be understood and the end of speech is that those sounds as marks may make known his ideas to the hearer that then which words are the marks of are the ideas of the speaker nor can any one apply them as marks immediately to anything else but the ideas that he himself hath for this would be to make them signs of his own conceptions and yet apply them to other ideas which would be to make them signs and not signs of his ideas at the same time and so in effect to have no signification at all words being voluntary signs they cannot be voluntary signs imposed by him on things he knows not that would be to make them signs of nothing sounds without signification a man cannot make his words the signs either of qualities in things or of conceptions in the mind of another whereof he hath none of his own 
until he has some ideas of his own he cannot suppose them to correspond with the conceptions of another man nor can he use any signs for them for thus they would be the signs of he knows not what which is in truth to be the signs of nothing but when he represents to himself other men's ideas by some of his own if he consent to give them the same names that other men do it is still to his own ideas to ideas that he has and not to ideas that he has not three examples of this this is so necessary in the use of language that in this respect the knowing and the ignorant the learned and the unlearned use the words they speak with any meaning all alike they in every man's mouth stand for the ideas he has and which he would express by them a child having taken notice of nothing in the metal he hears called gold but the bright shiny yellow color he applies the word gold only to his own ideas of that color and nothing else and therefore calls the same color in a peacock's tail gold another that hath better observed adds to shining yellow great weight and then the sound gold when he uses it stands for a complex idea of a shining yellow and a very weighty substance another adds to those qualities fusibility and then the word gold signifies to him a body bright yellow fusible and very heavy another adds malleability each of these uses equally the word gold when they have occasion to express the idea which they have applied to it but it is evident that each can apply it only to his own idea nor can he make it stand as a sign of such a complex idea as he has not four words are often secretly referred first to the ideas supposed to be in other men's minds but though words as they are used by men can properly and immediately signify nothing but the ideas that are in the mind of the speaker yet they in their thoughts give them a secret reference to two other things first they suppose their words to be marks of the ideas in the minds also of other men with whom they communicate for else they should talk in vain and could not be understood if the sounds they applied to one idea were such as by the hearer were applied to another which is to speak two languages but in this men stand not usually to examine whether the idea they and those they discourse with have in their minds be the same but think it enough that they use a word as they imagine in the common acceptation of that language in which they suppose that the idea they make it a sign of is precisely the same to which the understanding men of that country apply that name five secondly to the reality of things secondly because men would not be thought to talk barely of their own imagination but of things as really they are therefore they often suppose the words to stand also for the reality of things but this relating more particularly to substance and their names as perhaps the former does to simple ideas and modes we shall speak of these two different ways of applying words more at large when we have come to treat of the names of mixed modes and substances in particular though give me leave here to say that it is a perverting the use of words and brings unavoidable obscurity and confusion into their signification whenever we make them stand for anything but those ideas we have in our own minds six words by use readily excite ideas of their objects concerning words also it is further to be considered first that they being immediately the signs of men's ideas and by that means the instruments whereby men communicate their conceptions and express to one another those thoughts and imaginations they have within their own breasts there comes by constant use to be such a connection between certain sounds and the ideas they stand for 
that the names heard almost as readily excite certain ideas as if the objects themselves which are apt to produce them did actually affect the senses which is manifestly so in all obvious sensible qualities and in all substances that frequently and familiarly occur to us seven words are often used without signification and why secondly that though the proper and immediate signification of words are ideas in the mind of the speaker yet by familiar use of our cradles we come to learn certain articulate sounds very perfectly and have them readily on our tongue and always at hand in our memories and yet are not always careful to examine or settle their significations perfectly it often happens that men even when they would apply themselves to an attentive consideration do set their thoughts more on words than things nay because words are many of them learned before the ideas are known for which they stand therefore some not only children but men speak several words no otherwise than parrots do only because they have learned them and have been accustomed to those sounds but so far as words are of use and signification so far is there a constant connection between the sound and the idea and a designation that the one stands for the other without which application of them they are nothing but so much insignificant noise eight their signification perfectly arbitrary not the consequence of a natural connection words by long and familiar use as has been said come to excite in men certain ideas so constantly and readily that they are apt to suppose a natural connection between them but that they signify only men's peculiar ideas and that by a perfect arbitrary imposition is evident in that they often fail to incite in others even that use the same language the same ideas we take them to be signs of and every man has so inviolable a liberty to make words stand for what ideas he pleases that no one hath the power to make others have the same ideas in their minds that he has when they use the same words that he does and therefore the great augustus himself in the possession of that power which ruled the world acknowledged he could not make a new latin word which was as much as to say that he could not arbitrarily appoint what idea any sound should be a sign of in the mouths and common language of his subjects it is true common use by a tacit consent appropriate certain sounds to certain ideas in all languages which so far limits the signification of that sound that unless a man applies it to the same idea he does not speak properly and let me add that unless a man's words excite the same ideas in the hearer which he makes them stand for in speaking he does not speak intelligently but whatever be the consequence of any man's using words differently either from their general meaning or the particular sense of the person to whom he addresses them this is certain their signification in his use of them is limited to his ideas and they can be signs of nothing else end of an essay concerning humane understanding volume two excerpt by john locke sixteen thirty two to seventeen o four